Uh, we'll begin this uh, next session, uh, which is called Media and Whistleblowing, How to Get the Story Out When No One Wants to Hear. Uh, and so we're very fortunate to have Sean Holman as our moderator for this session. Um, Sean is the Wayne Crooks Professor of Environmental and Climate Journal, uh, uh, Journalism at the University of Victoria. Uh, he joined the faculty in 2021 from Mount Royal University, where he was an Associate Professor of Journalism. And before entering academia, Sean was an investigative journalist and documentary filmmaker in British Columbia. So Sean, I'm going to turn it over to you to uh, introduce uh, your speakers and conduct the proceedings from for this panel. Thank you. Thanks so much, Pamela. I really appreciate it. Journalism and whistleblowing really exist in a symbiotic relationship. For journalists, whistleblowers are the only means of obtaining information. The government has refused to release voluntarily, proactively, or in response to a freedom of information request. For whistleblowers, journalists are one of the few means of righting the wrongs that they have witnessed when other means of accountability have failed. This relationship has resulted in some of the most consequential reporting in the history of journalism, both in this country and elsewhere. But it can also be a complex relationship fraught by misunderstandings. Joining us to discuss that relationship today are four esteemed journalists. Alan Thompson is the head of Carleton University's School of Journalism, my alma mater, by the way, and a former political reporter with the Toronto Star specializing in foreign affairs and immigration issues. Sam Cooper is a national online investigative journalist with Global News and the author of Willful Blindness, a criminal network of narcos, tycoons, and CCP agents infiltrated the West. Jim Bronskill is a reporter in the Canadian Press's Ottawa Bureau, specializing in security, intelligence, policing, and justice issues. And Rachel Ward is an investigative journalist with the Fifth States documentary team, focusing on stories involving abuse and trauma. Thank you so much, all of you, for being here today. Each of these esteemed journalists will give a short presentation, uh, followed by a question and answer session where I think we'll have a robust discussion. So with that being said, um, Sam, I'm wondering if you can get us started. Sure, uh, thanks, Sean. And uh, any, everyone there, thank you so much for having me, uh, the panelists and, and the audience. And uh, when and if I turn off my video, please don't be alarmed. Uh, my, my bandwidth is challenged here, so you'll, you'll hear my audio when my face disappears. In fact, I'll turn it off right now because I don't want to lose you. So Sean, uh, I, I, I want to speak very briefly uh, about probably, you know, I've had some great sources in my life and I've had some great whistleblower sources. And as you indicated, they, whistleblowers often uh, lead to the most powerful, impactful stories. And what I've observed is uh, they, uh, as powerful as the stories are, they can have a very um, powerful and powerfully negative impact on the whistleblowers themselves. Um, you know, it, it's a mixed ride. And I think I can get in a little bit uh, into my observations of what happened to probably one of my best sources ever, who is, his name is Ross Alderson. It's a timely story because uh, the Cullen Commission in British Columbia into anti-money laundering is due to come back with its report uh, in about a week. And uh, really, I think uh, Ross himself and a lot of credible observers would say that the Cullen Commission never would have resulted had not Mr. Alderson uh, taken the giant leap of faith to, to leak, to use the vernacular, some very sensitive confidential documents to myself. I'll, I'll tell you briefly why he came to me, uh, the impact I think it had, and, and what occurred with Mr. Alderson in the aftermath. 
I should say that it's very rare that we, we talk about our sources in detail or name our sources. Uh, of course, their names, you know, uh, in the years following an impactful story do sometimes come to light. But Ross himself, because of what he was going through, uh, including losing his uh, employment in Canada with the BC Lottery Corporation, eventually having to return to Australia, where he had worked as a police officer to look for work because of the straits he found himself in Canada, he went uh, to another uh, media outlet, which was uh, the uh, uh, CTV investigative program and, and came forward with his story. So I can talk about uh, a little bit about what happened to him and why he came to me. He was following my work because I was uh, really digging into some similar areas that Sean had dug into. That would be uh, the corruption surrounding BC government casinos my area of interest was uh, real estate money laundering and uh, offshore funds and, and how I was discovering that often a great amount of money flowing into Vancouver real estate was tied to corruption in other countries. So Ross came to me, he leaked some documents which allowed me to name names of people that uh, really are at the center of what has become known as the Vancouver model of transnational money laundering. Uh, a lot of you will have some idea of that. This is how money uh, escapes from East Asia, gets around uh, China's capital controls and travels through underground banks into Canadian casinos. And really, of course, it's happening around the world. Uh, what Ross and others helped me discover was that uh, very elite transnational drug trafficking suspects were involved in this trade. And uh, as I uh, reported in my book, uh, very much involved as well a lot of uh, powerful state figures, police figures, and military figures, especially from China, but most definitely uh, people in that uh, shadowy world where authoritarian states, intelligence agencies, and organized crime cross over. And uh, uh, of course, I'd like to add right here, it's not just China, it's become very clear how, how much Russia, a country like uh, an authoritarian uh, state, wrote the blueprint for, for that kind of crime model. And so with Ross, after he leaked his information, after I had done a number of reports, uh, it, things came to a head with his bosses. Uh, he was put in a position where he had to leave his job. He felt uh, that he might have the protection of the British Columbia government who had uh, really banged the table about being out there and, and being there to protect whistleblowers. As some of you know, uh, they had benefited, I think, from some whistleblowers uh, who, who had uh, you know, dug up dirt that led to scandalous material surrounding the previous BC Liberal government. But Ross argues, and, and I think there's a lot to his argument, that once, uh, once this scandal touched the BC NDP government in a certain way, that is the BC casino story was ongoing. They said they were cracking down, but they really didn't seem very supportive of Mr. Alderson. So as I've indicated, he had to leave back to uh, Australia where he has some roots and some experiences. And uh, I can say that I just, I, I, I was um, somewhat, well, I was surprised, but I learned that uh, really we're talking about uh, damage to, to a family that had to leave Canada because there, there was no real protection in the aftermath. We're talking about a person that came to a, 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 a conflict in his mind where he knew that he had to support his family, and yet the, the, the level of criminality he was seeing in casinos where he was responsible for anti-money laundering, and yet all of his efforts uh, just because of the system that was in place, he came to believe that it, it just, it couldn't be enough. And uh, as he explains, and as I've written, that's why he came forward to me. And in the aftermath, I saw that there is a real personal impact on people that take that, what I call, you know, that last leap where, where you decide that even though I have a family to support, I hope that I can retain my job, but I just have to go to the press. That's what he did. And, uh, I think he's in a much better place now. Uh, I write in an update chapter of my book that uh, he's, he's, he, uh, he is well now, but he faces a ridiculous situation where uh, 
we will know when the final report for the Cullen Commission comes out, whether he will be held accountable for leaking documents to me that uh, led to the exposure of some uh, people that are allegedly at the top of transnational crime. And yet one of these suspects had the ability, since he gained some standing in this commission, to question Mr. Alderson directly about why he leaked uh, these documents to me. Uh, I think others have noted that the absurdity that you have a person uh, that, that uh, th from all indications is involved in uh, the worst type of criminality uh, that has the pulpit to question the whistleblower who leaked the documents that led to the whole commission, which is attempting to get at the center of the crime, not really, in my view, at why uh, a person made the leap to leak documents to a reporter. So uh, I'm hopeful that my remarks can, can add some sort of framework to, to both you know, how important whistleblowers can be, how important they've been uh, to my journalism career, which I like to think is focused on big public interest questions, and uh, the lack of framework uh, in Canada, especially in British Columbia, even despite uh, you know, pledges of the current government to protect whistleblowers, the, the evidence is that Mr. Alderson didn't fare very well uh, and yet, I, I, I'd like to end on a positive note that both he, I, and others do, I, I think it's fair to say that him coming forward, even though it impacted his career, his family, uh, in very negative ways, uh, he says that he's changed the province of British Columbia and indeed could change Canada's uh, justice and law enforcement system in some way. And I like to think that uh, he, he, he's opened the door to that changing. One of the, it, it remains to be seen whether the Cullen Commission <laughs> comes out with the recommendations that I think most Canadians would support or uh, whether uh, a very negative uh, finding occurs that which, which holds Mr. Alderson to account for leaking important records to myself. And so I'll, I'll tie up my remarks right there. And uh, I certainly hope to come back and be questioned on them in the panel afterwards. Thanks so much, Sam. Really appreciate it. Alan, um, you, of course, have also had a storied journalism career um, and had experience dealing with whistleblowers. So I'll just turn it over to you um, for your remarks now. Great. Thanks. Uh, well, Sean, you said it off the top. Uh, journalists and whistleblowers have a symbiotic, almost mythical uh, relationship um, at the core of our mission is this desire to hold the powerful to account. And in many cases, we just can't fulfill that mission without each other. Uh, so I fall into the first category, journalists. Although in theory, I guess, I could at some point find myself in the other camp as a whistleblower if ever I felt compelled to hold to account my own current home institution, Carleton University. Uh, I'm the head of Carleton's journalism program. I've been teaching journalism uh, for almost 19 years. Before that, in the first 18 years of my career, I was a reporter for the Toronto Star, much of that time as a political reporter in the Ottawa Bureau. And as a political reporter, like others on the panel, uh, I was called upon to hold the powers that be to account. And yes, in that capacity, met and interacted with a number of whistleblowers, or at least was very much aware of their role in the work that we're doing. Um, there has been this integral relationship. And I just want to explore that a little bit with others. I'm not sharing, uh, unlike this morning's panels, you know, a deep uh, social science research project. That's for another day. But I think there is some value, and I'm glad there is a media panel here just to look at the role of, of journalists uh, in the interaction with whistleblowers. And uh, I'm going to be largely anecdotal. I want to share uh, a bit about a couple of my direct experiences with whistleblowers and try to pull out of that some lessons. Um, most of this will echo what you would have heard this morning if you were on the uh, in, in the event, because one conclusion off the top, despite the symbiotic relationship that journalists have with whistleblowers, I think we have to concede that we do not always champion these whistleblowers or come to their defense when the institutions that they work for are trying to grind them down. Uh, it is an honor to be on the same virtual stage as the legendary Romeo Dallaire, uh, who is a hard act to follow and uh, 
will be tied the person who's invited to talk about Rwanda at the same event uh, as the ambassador of memory uh, from Rwanda, uh, General Dallaire. Um, I've had the privilege of the years to spend a lot of time with Romeo to report on his journey, uh, his tireless advocacy for the memory of what happened in, in Rwanda and for the rights of war affected children. And I suspect Romeo doesn't think of himself in this way, but to my mind, he has become something of a whistleblower uh, using his insider knowledge of major institutions to try to hold the powerful to account. Um, as I'll discuss a bit later, uh, General Dallaire's role in Rwanda as commander of that mission meant that his life would interact with one of the most important whistleblowers of the last century, in my view, a man uh, they called Jean-Pierre. Uh, more on that um, in a moment. Um, this relationship between journalists and whistleblowers. Uh, yes, we are partners in blowing the whistle, um, but there are, there are some particular challenges on the journalistic side. We have to establish the identity of the whistleblower. It's not always self-apparent who this person is, who they are, uh, why they wanna tell us this story. Um, do they have an ax to grind? Even ax grinders can sometimes have a really important story that we make decisions about telling. Uh, really, really important issues about protecting their anonymity if they're seeking anonymity, verifying the information that they share with us, balancing the news value uh, in a democratic society of disclosing essentially state secrets. Um, how do we balance that with preserving national security, protecting lives, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And I'm always mindful of the witch hunt response that many major institutions take toward whistleblowers. And uh, it explains the courage that it takes uh, to blow the whistle. So a couple of cases I, I want to touch on briefly. Spoiler alert, I think uh, the lessons from these cases are crystal clear. Major institutions will use their power to thwart and harm whistleblowers. And many of those who work in the upper echelons of our major institutions reject the very concept of whistleblowing as somehow dishonorable or disloyal. Uh, one episode involves uh, a key whistleblower behind the Somalia affair, the scandal around the torture killing of a Somali teenager by Canadian peacekeepers in 1993, a killing that was preceded by several other uh, suspicious deaths. The second case I want to point to uh, at General Dallaire's invitation um, is Rwanda and the figure who I would suggest was Africa's deep throat. Um, this mysterious informant Jean-Pierre who shared with Romeo's headquarters in Kigali warnings of impending massacres of Tutsi civilians. These warnings were provided and shared with the UN leadership months before the massacres began in April of 1994. Uh, first, um, Somalia. Uh, Major Barry Armstrong was a military doctor in the Canadian Airborne Regiment. He was serving in Bella Twain in 1993 as part of that US-led peacekeeping mission. Years later, the Commission of Inquiry into the Somalia mission would conclude that a failure of leadership and discipline contributed to the brutal killings of several Somali civilians by Canadian troops. There was also evidence of an attempt by members of the military high command to minimize or even cover up those incidents. In uh, one very important case, um, I know people will recall the torture killing of Shadane Aron, 16 year old Somali teenager, but weeks before that, Barry Armstrong found himself examining the body of a Somali man, Ahmed Arush, who'd been shot and killed outside the perimeter of the Canadian camp. That was on March 4th, 1993. Uh, we learned later uh, that Canadian soldiers, frustrated by the frequent looting of their camp by Somali civilians, had laid a trap outside the base, essentially leaving bait to attract Somali looters. Armstrong's examination of Arush's body led him to conclude that Arush had been struck down by a bullet shot from a distance, then killed by final shots taken up close execution style. Uh, that finding shocked him to the core. He reported this to his superiors um, up the chain, but concluded that no action was going to be taken. He wrote home to his wife, Jennifer, expressing his horror. Uh, in a detail that many forget, it was in some respects Armstrong's wife, Jennifer, who was the whistleblower. She shared that letter with a Toronto Star reporter, and word also spread to others 
story broke in the House of Commons, Armstrong himself somewhat reluctantly became one of our most famous whistleblowers as the story uh, caught fire. And a year later, he was in the media again, accusing the high command of a cover-up. And those allegations triggered the establishment of the Somalia affair. So there's this sort of compound impact of Armstrong's revelations. And they also made him a target for the military high command. And I learned this uh, directly. Um, he became the target of a smear campaign uh, that involved the minister's office as well as DND. And this is something that I eventually wrote about, and it's something that I'm not proud of. Um, I was a relatively new member of the Stars Ottawa Bureau at the time in 1994, found myself covering the Somalia scandal, didn't know as much about it as many others. And so, of course, I was delighted when the defense minister's press secretary called me up and dangled a scoop in front of me. Now, remember Armstrong's examination of the body of Arush and his allegations of an execution style killing. Uh, the military sent investigators later, a forensic pathologist examined uh, Arush's remains and came to very different conclusions and essentially suggested that Armstrong didn't know what he was doing, misjudged the situation, et cetera. Uh, that material was leaked to, to smear Armstrong and the military used me to do it. And I think what's notable about this case, we sort of assume that uh, whistleblowers will be the target of these attacks. We don't often see uh, the evidence of it. And in this case, because so many documents were released through the Somalia inquiry, we were able to see how they went about contacting me, asking me to actually ask them to send me a document that I unwittingly published and contributed to that smear campaign. So I think that case is very instructive and we really only learned about it because of all the documents that came out through the Somalia inquiry. A year later, Rwanda, and we know the storyline and, and General Dallaire has just taken us through it again over lunch. But uh, the key point, I think, from a whistleblower point of view was the interaction with Jean-Pierre, a Rwandan man who brought information to Dallaire's office uh, Dallaire didn't meet with him directly, but uh, officers in Dallaire's command did. And that information was the subject of this famous, famous January 1994 cable that Romeo sent to headquarters, later referred to as the genocide facts. Uh, and he told them, this informant tells me arms are being cached, uh, people are being trained, thousands of people will be killed uh, per minute. Um, and has he, has he recounted? He was told, no, you cannot intervene in this case. You cannot raid those arms caches. And in the end, the massacre is unfolded three months later. Uh, it's still murky who the informant was, whether he genuinely knew what was going to happen or if coincidentally his predictions came true. But the reality is this incredible information was shared with Dallaire's headquarters. Dallaire shared it internally up the chain of command um, and no action was taken. Uh, moments ago, General Dallaire told us he used every media tool available to him in Rwanda. Um, but I think there is one tool that he opted not to use. And uh, I adore Romeo. And uh, I'm not suggesting that had he leaked that cable and had he leaked the information from his informer, essentially had he chosen to become a whistleblower, I'm not sure if that would have changed anything. I'm not sure if it would have changed the course of events. Um, there is a case that maybe if while these killings were going on, we actually realized there had been warnings about this. There had been a whistleblower. There had been all these attempts to alert the UN High Command. Would that have changed anything? I don't know. But General Dallaire has been asked uh, over the years why he didn't leak uh, the informant's warnings, uh, why he essentially chose not to be a whistleblower in that case. And I think it's instructive that uh, in, in at least one instance, I think General Dallaire's view was that it wasn't his place to leak confidential UN documents to the media and that he wasn't going to do that. And he does rightfully, I guess, dispute whether or not 
those types of media revelations, whether if he had become a whistleblower, if it would have made any difference anyway. But uh, I just think it's it's interesting. Um, his own instinctive response in that case was not to leak those documents uh, because of his his role and his place in the military. So those are a couple examples that I think uh, just tell us something about the interaction between journalists and and whistleblowers. And there are, of course, many, many other Canadian examples. And uh, I'll leave it to others to touch on some of those and look forward to the discussion and the questions to follow. Thanks. Thanks so much, Alan. And, you know, Alan, you know, you raised sort of a, an interesting point, which is sort of what are the barriers that get in the way of whistleblowers blowing the whistle, interacting with the news media, actually disclosing otherwise secretive information that is in their possession. Uh, so I'd like to now turn to Jim, uh, talk a little bit more about that and how whistleblowers can sometimes work better uh, with the news media. Jim. Thanks, Sean. Uh, yeah, I'd like to use my time to talk about some of the best practices and frankly, some of the challenges for uh, whistleblowers in, in dealing with the media. As we know, newsrooms have shrunk. Uh, there are fewer mainstream reporters who have the time and the patient editors to do truly investigative pieces. Uh, having said that, there's a growing number of smaller online outlets generally that do fine work, often specializing in areas such as the environment and indigenous affairs. And more traditional outlets are realizing that they must do stories that matter if they want to survive. So here are a few thoughts for anyone who wants to expose wrongdoing in the media. Uh, first off, have you tried official channels? Yes, complaint offices and watchdogs might be seen as ineffective in many cases, but a journalist is likely to take you more seriously if you have tried the official routes first. At the very least, a reporter will ask why you haven't done so. Does your case illustrate a trend? Uh, unique cases can, of course, be worthy of attention, but a, report, uh, might, a reporter might be more interested if your concern illustrates a pattern or a trend that stretches beyond your case. A good reporter will ask you uh, if you have an ax to grind, as Alan mentioned, or if you are truly coming forward out of a sense of public duty. And that, that's a process that, that takes time to figure out uh, in interactions with the reporters in question. In, in approaching the media, can you summarize your case or your concern in a few paragraphs? Journalists are deluged with unsolicited emails and news releases, so a good way uh, to get a reporter's attention is to ask if they are open to reading it, uh, a five paragraph summary of your case or concern. This is a time investment uh, many journalists are, are willing to make. And, you know, I think if you can't distill your, your case into uh, a one page summary, um, maybe it, it, it begs questions about what what uh, the nature of it and, and whether it is indeed uh, a focused story or concern. Do not, uh, <laughs> well, first off, can you prove what you are alleging uh, in, in sharing information with the journalist? It's not good enough that something is merely true, as Alan suggested. A journalist has to be able to know and show that it is true. So do you have documentary evidence of what you're alleging and can it be verified uh, independently? Do not swamp a journalist with hundreds of pages of material and emails. Um, if interested, they will ask you for follow-up materials and make it clear what they need to help tell the story. Uh, I would add, in, in my opinion, no means of electronic communication is secure. Uh, despite all the signals and apps and, and things out there, um, it, it seems every time we turn around, there's a story about uh, an allegedly secure platform being leaked or hacked. Uh, alternatives include meeting a journalist uh, in person 
or communicating via old fashioned postal mail, as I, I suggested one uh, individual do in, in the last few months. Are you willing to be named? Um, public interest stories can make use of anonymous sources, uh, especially when they involve leaks or um, important information or documents that reveal corruption or other wrongdoing. But some stories require a human face or voice to help the audience relate to the issue. Uh, the Canadian press has a pretty strict policy on use of anonymous sources, so that um, can sometimes be a barrier in itself to telling a story or uh, other means need to be found to, to tell the story. In addition, uh, media will not necessarily promise complete anonymity, or, or maybe they're simply not able to do so. For instance, a reporter who promises not to reveal your name uh, should be asked how far that pledge extends. What if the reporter winds up in court and a judge asks that the name of their source be revealed? These things should be thought about ahead of time. Are you willing to be photographed? Uh, visuals are important uh, to stories more than ever in the uh, in internet and video age. So you might be asked to go in front of a camera, either a still one or a video. Have you considered the consequences? Uh, as you know, um, many, and, and we've touched on already today, many whistleblowers can face severe consequences. Uh, they might be shunned by colleagues, face dismissal from jobs, or even prosecution in court, as uh, and Sam's uh, anecdote uh, paints the, the dangers of that quite, quite vividly. So going public uh, should be carefully considered uh, in dealing with the media. And I think, you know, it, it's incumbent on the media to, to bear that in mind as well. We all want a good story, but uh, I think we need to ask ourselves whether it's in the best interests of the individual to go public and to, to make it clear uh, what they're risking if, if they do so. Uh, those are my thoughts. Uh, I'll leave it there since I know we're short on time and I look forward to uh, the discussion. Thanks so very much, Jim. Um, and I think you've really articulated some of the challenges that journalists face uh, when working with whistleblowers and some of the things that might make that relationship a little bit easier on the part of both journalists and whistleblowers. But Rachel, I'd like to now turn it over to you to talk a little bit more about some of the traumatic dimensions um, that are involved in that relationship um, and the real um, uh, fraught uh, environment that whistleblowers face um, when actually disclosing this kind of information. Rachel. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you for having me. It's an honor to be here among so many uh, whistleblowers in the audience, it's incredible. So I work on a unique program. We do long-term investigations and documentaries. Um, also worked in daily news for a very long time. To, to expose our systemic wrongs that are in society, we need these personal stories to really make sense of what's happening, these particular examples. Um, and often we have no idea what injustices are happening without people coming forward and showing us with their testimony and their evidence what's happening. Um, but to do that, uh, it requires exposing a deeply personal experience, often your most traumatizing experience, often one that you're living through right now. Um, I feel that journalists as well are driven by trauma in our work. We're seeking to expose those wrongs we're seeking to explore the trauma that it's causing. Um, and through that, we're also causing uh, trauma in, in our own work. Um, with uh, these whistleblower stories, um, I've been trying to explore how we can do a better job, both within my uh, organization and, and outside of it. Um, from, a, you know, from a beginning uh, stage, you know, how do we communicate securely with sources so that we're not going to be exposing them? How are we going to talk to them about the potential, like Jim was saying, the potential risk and harm 
of speaking publicly. How do we uh, manage all of that and you know, make a determination if the person is able to take that on and working with them to see how that might work out. This is, this is, this is no small task. And I would say that there's a very small group of journalists in Canada who um, are equipped to handle that kind of risk assessment um, and fewer who are able to actually handle the trauma of what we are doing and the trauma that the whistleblower is facing and then what we're also taking on ourselves. And I don't profess to be one of those people. I'm learning in an ad hoc way how to do that kind of work in the best possible way. And, and it's been um, an ongoing process throughout my career. Um, you know, I've learned the most from a story that I started on about a decade ago, um, investigating the military sexual assault crisis. And that was uh, one, I, it came to me while I was driving across the bridge in Halifax with a family member. Um, I grew up in a military family and I understand the basics of how it runs. Um, you know, the sense of loyalty, you're working towards the bigger goal, you're trying to do the right thing. That's the environment I was born into. Um, instead of joining the military, which, you know, I was handing the recruitment papers on my 16th birthday, jo joined the school newspaper instead. <laughs> um, but when that culture fails you, you know, and that mission fails you, it hurts, it hurts deeply, right? And um, Alan was just talking about some um, incredible military whistleblowers. I think they've really paved the way in, in this country over the years. Um, but when I was driving across that bridge that day, um, someone told me uh, about a harassment case in, in their office. So superior member in the office was sending sexual pictures to a junior staff member and trying to get her into a sexual relationship with him. This was a boss. And to my naive ears, I said, oh, well, that is that clearly not criminal harassment, at least. You know, uh, no, it was not. The man kept his job and it was a minor disciplinary blemish. I'm shocked. Naive young journalist, no idea what's going on. So new at CBC, I start on my investigative journey. I trying to delve in what's happening here. How is this possible? I, I thought the justice system worked differently. I request the data, I request the documents. Things aren't lining up. I don't know what's going on. The picture doesn't come clear until I start talking to people. Now, the military is an environment where there's a hierarchy and you're told from the beginning, you don't talk about things with journalists. I've sat in those trainings. They talk about the Queen's order and you know how you have to stay in your lane and, and all this business. And um, it's a huge thing to come forward and talk to a journalist, even on, on the background. Um, over the years, I've spoken to well over 100 people on this subject, well over 100 people who felt so deeply that they have risked their, uh, they've risked their careers, they've risked their mental health to tell a journalist about, you know, the horrible things that they've witnessed or encountered or supervised. You know, I've spoken with even managers who say that they turned a blind eye to criminal behavior that's happened on their watch because um, they were worried about their and most of spoken to me when they're on for mental illness. Because of the retaliation they in trying to raise the military members that they know about documenting. They know how to build their case. They know how to get the records. And so these folks, they have it, a lot of them have it detailed and that's what we need as journalists, right? We need that evidence and um, they're, uh, they've just been absolutely incredible. Um, thing is though, is in my journalism, I've reported very few of their stories, very, very few of their stories. More than a hundred people, I've reported a dozen. those stories every single time in people roll their eyes because I'm after them about about these stories um the thing is though is the people who make the decisions about the stories that we publish as a media outlet they're above the reporter level they're editors they're managers and they're balancing so many factors right they have um you know a particular focus for their show it might be local news in Cape Breton it might be their programs on the environment and my stories about the military or it might be that their story needs to resonate across the whole country and represent a broader systemic problem. 
um, it might be that we are on a different project and we have to work hours and hours of overtime to meet our deadline. So we have to weigh what's going on, um, our story against all the other priorities. And it can be very, very hard to slip that in as much as everyone in the room wants to do the right thing. And often I find that that is the case. Um, so yes, my pitches were generally put on the back burner, but finally a couple of years ago, I got through and I was able to direct the documentary about the sexual assault crisis um, and how the justice system, its own justice system, systemically downplays these crimes. So I was able to bring the story out because I had two strong whistleblowers who had documented their cases and were willing to go on camera. This is solely because they had gotten to the point in their lives where their mental health was at a position where they could, they could handle it. And they had a support network that they had built up independently of the media um, to get them through that experience. Um, their stories were so powerful. These are two women who were assaulted by their bosses um, who were in the military and listed members. And uh, in neither case were there criminal convictions. And these were very violent attacks. Um, the story comes out, you know, we separately had another police uh, whistleblower in it who talked about how his sexual assault cases were uh, prevented from moving forward. The commanding officers were intervening. They were trying to contact the victims. All of these problems is what was going on. So three whistleblowers finally brought the story together because they had they had that personal story. They were willing to go forward with the risk. They were happened to be in a position that limited the risk and they had the documentation. Um, and for whatever reason, I happened to hit that sweet spot at work where it just fit our goals and fit our workload at the right time. So the story comes out and then I get more tips. I got probably hundreds of emails, more assaults, more cover-ups, some were kids, right? Um, I can't, I can't verify them. I can't report on them. I can't contact some of them. I try to call every one of them, um, but I'm simply too swamped in my regular job, right? And you feel gutted because these people are so brave. They've been through so much and they're trusting you with their story, right? But you can't, you can't do everybody's story, right? You can't offer them that. So we, we carry those stories with us um, while recognizing you know, the limitations of what we have to offer. Um, what I'd like to see is um, more journalists in the field being empowered to have the skills to dig into these kinds of stories. So for starters, there's the investigative skills, which you know, a core group of people, people on this call included, um, have, have those skills to dig into, those verification skills that Jim was talking about. Um, how to do those risk assessments, how to appropriately seek accountability. Um, there's also uh, the skills of handling the stories with care and consideration through a trauma-informed lens and not just doing a risk assessment about will this person be outed? Will they be fired? What kind of retaliation will they face? But what kind of mental health um, considerations do we need to be thinking about? What kind of impact could that potentially have? And who in their life can we work with to mitigate that? Um, you know, I've, I've um, you know, in another, in another story about um, some soldiers who were tortured during their training, you know, I worked with the primary whistleblower on that and his psychologist and his wife to put in a plan afterwards to make sure that he was, you know, protected and ready to go. And, know and make sure that he knew what he was getting into and that way we had we had an escape route if that, if that came up um so i think as we go forward we have to remember how important your stories are um i think that many of you if you have come forward you may have gotten the i can't do your story response i hope this helps you understand where we're coming from um and i hope that as a profession, we can get to the point where more journalists are equipped. Um, and I think Jim's right. I think there is an increasing interest in these public interest stories. Um, so I hope we get there. Um, and what I'm trying to remember is that, you know, even with the few stories we are able to do, even though 
change is very hard to come by these days. Um, you know, at least the stories are helping other people who have also been traumatized in similar ways. Um, you know, and, and I'm hoping that that community will be built and will empower more people to to come forward and, and then encourage newsrooms to do more reporting. Thank you so much, Rachel. So um, now is the portion of uh, this panel discussion um, where we're going to have some Q and A's both among one another as well as with the audience. Um, and I think what I'm going to do is I'm going to start with uh, some of the audience questions because there is a little bit of a cue that's developed. Um, so the first question uh, from the audience is, uh, from your perspectives, um, should there be any legitimate legal barriers to public sector whistleblowers going to the media or should there be absolutely and completely no bar? Um, that seems like a, a question that uh, the most uh, of the panel members uh, would definitely probably want to tackle. Um, but I'll go with you first, uh, Alan, and then maybe we can go around. Uh, I would say no bar. Otherwise, it's a slippery slope. Where do you set the bar? How do you decide what the threshold is? Um, I, I think there are mechanisms in place for people to try and raise matters internally to lodge complaints internally but the whole nature of our watchdog role is we operate on the assumption that sometimes the system is broken so if the system is broken you cannot criminalize the behavior of someone who comes forward from a broken system to say that there's something wrong here rachel Yeah, I, I agree. And I think also, um, as journalists, we're sometimes working with an incomplete picture. So making that assessment of whether or not this meets some sort of criminal bar, it's not possible. Um, and I, I think, like Alan said, it, it is that the system is broken. And there's a reason why the internal complaint system didn't work. Um, we don't speak out without fear of death a very big harm for folks that come forward. And, and it would be nice to be a whistleblower protection that shielded them from that as well through some sort of process. Sam. Yeah, I can't I can't think of an argument in my mind why it should ever be illegal uh, to, to go to the media for a public interest reason and, and have a, a trained media assess that and, and report responsibly. But that's all to say there should never be a law against that. that. That's the bar. We have, I can see the argument in some national security cases where, you know, certain secrets do need to be protected. My work, uh, probably Jim as well, can, can understand in some areas there, there, there can be good arguments. But we have Securities Act uh, laws that, that cover the government in, in those areas. So there should never be, you know, a blanket criminality, even if you work for CSIS or the RCMP or the military to go to the press. Uh, the courts are already, um, you know, uh, equipped with, with laws to handle real national security danger secrets, I think. Jim. Yeah, I, I think that there's, you know, an abundant of, abundance of evidence that, that the current mechanisms um, are not sufficient um, in many respects, and we could probably have a whole panel on that. But but it it um, I think you know hopefully out of this conference uh, there will be some discussion about what is needed to be done at, at the federal level in Canada and perhaps provincially um, to come up with better models of of um, th that that make it safer and and more. Um, amenable for, for whistleblowers to come forward and not fear reprisal or or <laughs> worse consequences um, and and that would make journalist jobs easier um, you know the, the case law on um, protecting anonymous sources has just evolved very slowly in the last few years um, to, in, in a good direction for protection of sources but um, that has taken a long time so um, yeah, I, I, I don't pretend to have the answers, but um, it's clear that there are gaps. 
Now we have a question from Dan Beals. Dan writes, do you believe that journalists have an ethical responsibility to guide whistleblowers to the most effective communication strategy? Journalists are meant to be experts in communication while many whistleblowers are comparative novices. And Alan, that question was specifically asked of you. Uh, Jim and Rachel also spoke to this already in their responses. I mean, I think, uh, Ultimately, whistleblowers are sources, right? We're dealing with sources. We have uh, professional guidance ethically around how we deal with sources, how we engage with sources. Uh, this is not a collusion. If we are discussing with someone, what's the story? Tell me the story. Why does this matter? Uh, but if you're entering into an agreement with someone, especially where they need protection, they need anonymity, then we have a duty of care to answer questions and to provide information that some might see as guiding a communication strategy. We're telling people how to, how to take care of themselves, how to protect their identity, how we can establish a way that they can share this information with us. And I think we also have a duty, as Jim said, to make people understand, do you know what you're getting into? Do you understand the hellstorm that awaits you and your family in some cases, if you go down this route? And so is that guidance? Yes. Is it collusion? No, because it's, it's still a journalist source relationship and there are all kinds of boundaries around uh, the advice that you give. Yeah, absolutely. Um, Jim, Rachel, Sam, do you have anything to add to that? All right. So uh, Carol Boydell, uh, writes, in many places in Canada, whistleblower legislation for those who work in the public service is relatively new, and sometimes designated officers who are tasked with investigating whistleblower disclosures are new to the job or only conduct these investigations infrequently. As you all have experience in vetting disclosures of whistleblowers, do you have any advice for those in the public service about how to conduct investigations into disclosures. Jim, do you maybe want to start us off on that one? So by, by that, you mean uh, the, 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 the hunt for the leaker kind of thing? Um, um, no, I think, talking about? I think uh, who are tasked with investigating whistleblower disclosures. So, Carol, unless I'm uh, incorrect, I believe you're meaning um, investigating um, when a whistleblower um, has had some information um, that is problematic and is trying to raise that oh. information internally. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I mean, um, it's, it's a really good point because federally there are mechanisms and channels and, uh, and pretty clear um, steps that, that people are recommended to take when they notice wrongdoing. And, and you know, uh, far be it for me to say, uh, you know, ignore them. <laughs> you, you should um, follow the procedures and, and it's in your interest and, and they're there for a reason. Uh, whether they're effective or not, I don't know. I know that there are lots of cases where um, you know, alleged wrongdoing is, is brought to the attention of someone and th there's a mechanism federally, as many know, um, for the disclosure of, of wrongdoing, uh, the public sector integrity uh, commissioner mechanism. And, you know, um, it, 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 it gets sticky, I think, when uh, those mechanisms don't work and, and the person who's blowing the whistle, if you will, um, th their, their complaint or concern is dismissed as, oh, well, there's nothing wrong here. And I think that's when uh, they come to a crossroads of, okay, well, what do I do now? And that's, yeah. So, um, you know, I know that there have been <clears throat> calls, um, certainly Sean is, is well aware and, and involved in, in some of these discussions about um, uh, beefing up the, the federal mechanism to name just one. Uh, for these kinds of disclosures. And, you know, we can ask the question as to whether there is robust enough protection and assurance that, that the complaint will see the light of day under the, the current regime. 
Yeah, I think I think uh, what Carol is also sort of getting at, though, too, is you have essentially, um, you know, all of these public servants, or at least some public servants, who have been sort of thrust into the role in some ways of a journalist, right, which is the sort of the discipline of verification. Um, trying to determine whether or not a whistleblower complaint is correct or not, trying to determine what the best steps forward are when it comes to that whistleblower complaint, um, and not having a lot of training to do that. Um, so is there anything that... Yeah, I would just um, quickly add it in that, yeah. in that vein. We've seen a trend recently where, um, you know, departments have brought in outside experts with, with that um, skill set to do things. So in, for instance, uh, at Rideau Hall, when there were allegations about the former governor general's behavior, uh, a consultant was brought in to do an investigation. And, um, you know, it seemed to work because th their arm's length, they had no stake in it. Uh, they were hired to do it by the government and issued a report to the government. And, you know, it, it's unfortunate and expensive and, you know, that outside people have to be brought in but but that is one means of doing it absolutely this is uh rachel alan sam do you have anything further to add on that front i suppose it's not a solution um I, i've heard from these offices that it's a struggle to well there's, there's two kind of core problems one is that the people blowing the whistle don't have the confidence that their jobs will be protected, that they won't face retaliation in their career. And so they want to keep their, um, they want to keep their identity secret, even within the, the context of their complaint, um, which, which then hamstrings, of course, the, uh, the investigation. Um, and the second one, which I'm sure Carol knows about is the investigation, the, the other people in the department that you need the records from to do the verification, those aren't always offered up. I mean, there's been some pretty um, uh, notorious examples of that in the military where the ombudsman has not been able to do those investigations. So, um, yeah, I, I don't know what kind of solution there if the actual system is broken, because those are two pretty big uh, barriers to you being able to do your job. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, now we have a question from Pam, who is, uh, of course, one of our esteemed conference organizers. Pamela, did you want to go ahead? That I'm on, I'm live. Am I? Yes. Can you hear me? Yes. Thank oh. you. Thanks, Sean. Um, so yes, this is um, for Sam, and um, I just wanted to ask Sam. Um, I read your book on willful blindness, of course, and I noticed that you draw a lot on information from uh, Brian McAdam, a whistleblower from the 1990s who warned uh, foreign affairs and the government um, at that time that the Chinese triads, uh, i.e. criminals, were illegally entering Canada through corruption at the Canadian Hong Kong High Commission at the time. So do you see a link between suppression of this and other whistleblowers at the time and the state of affairs re money laundering today based on criminal activities. Thanks for the question. And uh, Mr. McAdams case has been reported on by a, a number of newspapers. And I, I certainly have seen records that, that not everyone has seen. Uh, to get right to your question, I mean, the way I approached his information and, and some of his colleagues from the 1990s was there needed to be corroboration, verification, because the claims were shocking. And indeed, uh, not all of the information can be proven. But, but what can be proven through my research is that uh, law enforcement and intelligence agencies around the world, including uh, the United Kingdom, the United States, have made similar observations that, that uh, Mr. McAdam did. And I learned more that a lot of his reporting uh, stemmed from his contacts with uh, uh, British intelligence officers in Hong Kong and uh, uh, observations that came from American and Australian intelligence. So when I sift everything that that Mr. McAdam has said and that you know I refer to in my writing, there's a lot of weight to it, and yet 
really none of that high level information that alleges that a, a foreign state is involved in state sponsored crime in Canada as and a, a, is deeply involved in corporate relations in Canada. To my knowledge, that has never uh, reached uh, you know, a Canadian court in the sense that some of the people involved have been named and charged. And yet I can, I can confirm that in my discussions with uh, officials in the United States and, uh, and, and the United Kingdom, the, the very same names, I'm talking about high level Hong Kong bankers that Mr. McAdam was concerned about for criminal connections, they are concerned about as well and, and, and would say currently that the risks uh, Mr. McAdam alleged uh, years ago are, are growing and, and are very salient uh, to, to risks to Canada now, and, and I would argue are very, uh, are very, uh, you know, connected to the, I, I don't want to jump too far by saying the war in Russia, because very similar criminal and state networks are involved in the same type of corruption that, that, uh, that laid the groundwork for Russia's invasion, invasion of Ukraine. So, uh, what, what has happened to Mr. McAdam, uh, I, I, it's fair to say that he has suffered uh, indeed mentally and uh, his career has suffered. And uh, there is still, I would say, there, there's not an admission or acknowledgement uh, at, at, at the bureaucratic level uh, in, in Canada's government that, that much of what he and his colleagues were saying has turned out to be true. So to, to me, uh, just the simple answer to your question is, I think there's, there has not been any real uh, protection or, or sort of redress to people like Mr. McAdam that were pointing to some very, uh, very concerning allegations. And I'm not saying they all uh, can be proven, but a lot of them have been, uh, uh, a lot of them are live issues today in, in Canada and the world. Thank you. And now we have a question from Jessica for Jim. Uh, I'm often asked what my agenda is when I bring injustices to light. My agenda is bringing the injustices to light, so the question confuses me. Why do you think having an axe to grind is considered to be mutually exclusive with public interest? Uh, you know, I, I think, uh, as we've maybe discovered today, a lot of these cases are, are uh, like snowflakes. They're, 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 all, they're all different in their own way. Uh, <laughs> And it's hard to characterize them in any kind of general way. So I think that as part of the, the due diligence um, an investigator uh, journalist goes through in, in, in looking at a case is, is they have to ask these questions. Um, and uh, the two are not mutually exclusive. The, the, the person um, who's exposing the injustice or what they see as an injustice um, me uh, undoubtedly is very passionate about it and uh, sees it as as um, uh, a cause to pursue and and you know if you if you want to characterize that as an axe to grind okay um, it, it may not I mean I think what we're talking about here is um, you know the rare instance where where something is a personal vendetta um, that you know that it's grounded more in a personal dislike of someone of of a boss, of a um, uh, an institution, uh, and not so much grounded in in verifiable fact or a broad based concern about the way that person or or institution behaves, and and those are, are very you know obviously very murky and and must be uh, determined on a case by case basis. So um, you know. Um, I think it's important not to be dismissive and um, of of someone's concerns if they're passionate about a cause. Um, you know, there there are lots, obviously, um, environmental issues, um, any range of things. Um, the, the person exposing it, um, uh, you know, it's good that they have a stake and that they care about the issue. Um, you know, as journalists, we want that in a story. Um, you know. It, it means that it affects people, that it, it, it affects this person who's blowing the whistle and, and therefore probably others will be angry about it too when they hear it. So um, I think it's more just weeding out the, you know, hopefully rare instances where um, uh, 
it, it, it's a case that that's built more on uh, personal dislike or vendetta. And, and I wouldn't want to characterize most cases to be that. Alan, Sam, Rachel, do you have anything further to add? Yeah, Sean, I would, I would add that I, I think a lot of people on the panel know the, the saying to the effect that uh, politics is personal. And I, I think we all know that life in our own lives, uh, in our workplaces, there are politics. And, and we as reporters, I think we, we would never say that someone might have a little bit of an ax to grind with their institution because they, they feel that the institution isn't following the values that it may espouse in meetings every day and there may be cover ups going on so we're, we're people and you know we people have to uh, have to wait whether the someone that's that's talking to them has a good perspective on the situation are they seeing the broader public interest issues the personal issues and and where do they come down on that scale and uh, I, it's not a there's not a science to it but I think we're all we sort of get a gut and a training for assessing, you know, is someone looking at it in a balanced way? And it can be as simple as that. I think I've only had um, one case where I suspected that the personal vendetta was outweighing the bigger picture. Um, the thing is, is that when these things happen to you and you witnessed wrongdoing, or you've been subjected to it or what have you, you're often facing retaliation internally and you can't help but feel um, angry or, or these, these, these feelings against the institution that's, that's wrong to you. Um, and in, in the one case where I felt like maybe this was overreaching, um, I end up not doing the story because of that. I end up not doing the story of the agents of the plan together with that um, case. And, I wasn't able to uh, identify the story that they said was existed there through independent means. Um, so I think it's important to understand where people are coming from. It also helps us understand uh, what kind of obstacles we might be facing when we publish, um, what kind of questions might be asked from, from the public or from the institutions. Um, and then we can fully understand the bigger picture and prepare for that when we go towards publication as well. Um, so, so those are very, very important questions to be asked. Um, and uh, never has that um, been the reason to prevent me from lo looking at the story. Yeah. If it's okay, would it be okay if, uh, with the panelists if I just added something to that? Yeah, of course. In, um, in my own experience, um, I find that you know, conflict in the workplace often emerges, right, as a result of whatever wrongdoing is happening, right? Um, and, you know, whistleblowers, you know, oftentimes, um, because they are willing to take the extra step of publicly disclosing something um, that otherwise wouldn't be disclosed, times can be sometimes iconoclastic individuals, like a lot of investigative journalists are, right? Um, so we get that, right, in a lot of ways, right? There's a lot of personality traits that we share, which also means that oftentimes investigative journalists sometimes don't fit in well with newsrooms either. Um, so I, I think for us, it's always about, you know, untangling that. Right. And, um, you know, journalism is discipline of verification. Right. So we have to figure out what what has been, you know, what where is the public interest here? Right. And what is the, you know, office conflict, political conflict, um, personnel conflict that has resulted from that. Right. And how do we separate those two things? Um, so it is a question like we need to ask in the back of our minds, but we also understand where whistleblowers are coming from, that it is a complex situation, right? That is arisen from wrongdoing. Um, and now we have a question uh, from Rhonda, uh, Rhonda Startman. 
Um, Rhonda has two questions for Sam. One, when your, your book was first published, it was unavailable almost everywhere. You think copies were bought up by a group or organization that didn't want others to read it. And second question is, how does the relationship between Canadian corporations and the media influence the publication of a whistleblower's story? Well, oh, um, it's almost a flattering question, but I would say on the first one, uh, I, I don't think any of any any uh, conspiracy was happening. I think the we were surprised, or the publisher, you know, got, we got a great reaction, and so the presses had to be ramped up. Um, on the, sorry, could you repeat the second question? Yeah, the second question was, how does the relationship between Canadian corporations and the media influence the publishing of a whistleblower's story? Well, you know, that that's a big one. And I would almost invite uh, my learned panel colleagues to chip in on that one as well. But I, you know, I mean, uh, it's a tough one. But you, to be honest, I, there's some there, there are some cases where you can see, you know, uh, for lack of a better term, you know, big, big corporations are big advertisers. Um, you know, let me put it this way, because I've written about this, so it gives me some ground and safety. Look, I came from a newsroom where I knew that reporting on uh, real estate was a sensitive topic because I lived in a city where the biggest advertisers <laughs> were, were developers and they're very influential people. Luckily, as I've, always, as I've also written, I, I had some uh, editors that, that were tough investigative reporters. And even though they were facing pressure, uh, they, they protected me. That didn't mean that my life didn't become uncomfortable, you know, because of the, the ground I was digging on that. But I survived. But I can draw from that, that look, this pressure does exist. And it's important for, as the people have spoken, Jim spoke about, you know, the pressures on media. I think it's more important. My, my two axes to grind are, it's important that uh, media corporations be strengthened to do this tough public interest reporting. And I really believe that Canadian uh, uh, laws protecting free speech and uh, anti-defamation or anti-slap as they call it uh, lawsuits need to be strengthened. So that's my ranting done on that question. <laughs> Sam and uh, uh, Rachel, Alan, uh, Jim, do you have any, Alan? I think the public trust aspect of it um... I mean, we're now living in a really toxic media environment. And I think that environment uh, probably makes it more complicated, the, the relationships that journalists establish with unnamed sources, with confidential sources, some of whom are by definition whistleblowers, maybe becomes even more fraught because now there's a significant constituency out there that thinks we just make this stuff up. And, and they're told that by elected uh, officials that don't believe that, they just make that stuff up. And it's just, I think it complicates the work that we do because uh, it's, it's the trust we establish with the sources, but the trust with the audience that they can trust us to be the interlocutor who uh, brings to them these people who have the confidence to go to a journalist and share this information and and bring it to the public i just i just think that's a further complicating factor right now and i don't know what we do about that it's it's uh it's really troubling it really is question from dan beals uh for rachel ward or jim bronskill or both have you found any counter surveillance training available to journalists? If you recognize a gap in your knowledge before speaking to a whistleblower, how would you go about learning these necessary skills? Um, I can jump in. I, I took one today. Uh, I'm at the Canadian Association of Journalists uh, conference at the moment, and they had a digital security uh, uh, session. Um, I have taken Maybe I did misspeak a little bit. I have taken numerous courses on it. Um, I helped the group down in the States develop a manual for digital security as well. Um, all of this I've sought out on my own uh, through sort of external journalism associations. Um, uh, I can't speak for CBC. I do know that they've hired um, 
uh, some experts that are helping us to ramp up our skills, which is fantastic. Um, but the journalism associations are a really great resource um, that are really starting to focus on digital security. And so I think we're getting there. I know, um, like I tried organizing a panel on this maybe five, six years ago, and I think four <coughs> people attended it. And today the room was filled with 50 people. So I think the understanding is it's increasing. Um, I hope it keeps increasing. I learn new things every time I start reading more about it. Um, and uh, I mean, like, like Jim said, you know, there's flaws with um, all the various means. Um, I live in Alberta and the former justice minister has been accused of hiring someone to get a copy of a journalist's phone records because a whistleblower told her that he had held a wedding that broke COVID protocols. So somehow he illegally accessed her phone records and the guy who helped him do it went to the media. Um, and I'm, that just blows my mind, right? Like, what do we do with that in this environment that someone in the public trust could potentially have that kind of access? Um, so, I mean, I, I think I think people are starting to starting to realize, and I mean, the training has has increased dramatically even just in the last five years. Yeah, I, I don't have too much to add to what Rachel said. I, I took the the CHA uh, course. Uh, I think that that you've. <laughs> Just took as well recently, and, and it's it was really valuable. Uh, the Reporters Committee for Freedom of the Press in the states has done a lot of good work on this. Um, there are resources out there, and uh, kudos to Rachel for seeking them out. It you know we shouldn't have to do this on our own. Um, uh, my company, Canadian Press, did did uh, sort of not just toward doing the the CAJ session, which was great, um, but yeah, we we could use more of that. Um, but uh, I assume, you know, common, a good dose of common sense also helps. And, uh, you know, um, I assume that anything written in an email might be published someday, somewhere, somehow. It probably won't, but, but you know, um, we all have to be mindful of, of what we say in, in emails and, and conduct, as I said earlier, uh, conversations face to face if we can, um, you know. Um, be be uh, mindful of of the, the the you know hopefully the, the Alberta case is the extreme but it can happen it's a reminder that there are dangers um, and you know there are laws uh, wiretap laws and and uh, you know CSIS needs to get um, targeting approval and such so but you know the, these things are not beyond the realm of possibility when we enter into uh, these kinds of, of intense investigations. So it's good to be mindful of, of all of this. I think we have uh, time for one final question just before we wrap up. Um, how do you get past non-disclosure agreements within contracts, especially in healthcare, healthcare workers face reprimand from regulatory bodies and risk having to not only lose their job, but also their entire career due to these agreements if they came forward with uh, information to the media. Does anyone want to jump in there? John, yeah, I would, um, I mean, that's a, that's a good common sense question. And I can, again, circle back to, you know, Ross Alderson's story and uh, he took some precautions, but when, as someone else said, when the hell storm started, uh, uh, he, he eventually had, you know, had to had to step away from his job. I, he was presented with a situation where he had to, uh, and and no no amount of I, I think not any amount of precaution can can prepare a person for a huge story and just a a media firestorm. And when when reporters or institutions are chipping away from all sides there's little you could protect yourself from in terms of saving your job if you've signed an NDA. So we could go back to the last answer. <laughs> I mean, if you really think your story is that powerful enough and, and needs to see the light of day that much that you would breach your contract, 
you probably should look into, uh, you know, using encrypted devices and and being even if the reporter says we can I learn your identity, you would maybe I shouldn't say this, but it's probably in your interest to say no that I have documents. I'll I will send them in the mail. I I will I'll present a thumb drive or something, but I will never ever say my name because I want to keep my job. That's just a a common sense way of looking at it, I think. And and uh, also in sort of a, uh, if I could just maybe add one thing to that, um, you know, also be aware that um, journalists have varying skill levels at, at being able to see what the risk might be to their sources um, and whether or not the use of certain information might disclose a source. Um, so just be really cautious about that, right? I've seen journalists come out with stories where even though the individual isn't named, it's very clear who the individual might be. Um, and it wouldn't take much for that to be proven on government side of the equation or institutional side of the equation. So just be really aware, right, uh, that, that um, the journalist's ability to do that risk assessment may not sometimes be great and your own ability to do that risk assessment may not be great either um and the number of times where i've had to protect a source from themselves um you know is is in the dozens um just because i knew that it would would put the source at risk alan did you want to add anything to that well just i think uh, with a minute left like i think yeah. to go back to where you started like this symbiotic relationship between journalists and whistleblowers. We've been talking about it largely from the point of view of journalists, how we do our jobs, what we can share or learn. But I also think it's incumbent on us as journalists <clears throat> to really underline this duty of care that we have to these sources. We rely on these individuals to help us to hold institutions of power to account. And yet we hear over and over and over about how they are not systematically protected and especially yeah. under Canadian law those protections aren't there I think we should be advocating more as journalists for whistleblowers and for their protection and for their rights in the same way that we don't feel it's a conflict for us as journalists to advocate about freedom of the press and freedom of expression that's not taking a side that's just speaking for something that's important to our democracy and I think Everything that I heard so far at this conference today is that I think journalists need to advocate more uh, for whistleblowers and for their protection. And that seems like a wonderful note to end on. Um, I'd like to thank uh, all the panelists uh, for being here today, Jim, Sam, Rachel, Alan. Uh, thank you so much for your insight. And I'd also like to thank the audience as well um for the wonderful questions and wonderful insights that you brought to bear during this discussion and of course our conference organizers as well for creating this opportunity for a forum to discuss what is a fundamental issue to democracy in this country thank you so very much <laughs>